Being immortalized is the most exclusive club, and it's by invitation only. You can't buy a membership, you can't use political influence, you can't cheat your way into it. Everybody wants in. Presidents, kings, celebrities, political leaders create effigies and build monuments just to be immortalized. Dictators create a culture that's nothing short of idol worship. Children sing their praises every single day. All of this in an effort to be remembered. Think of what Muawiyah did. He tried every trick in the book, yet nothing remains of him in his own capital city. The only significant ancient structure that remains erect in Damascus is the shrine of Hussein's three-year-old orphan. What this means is to become immortal, one has to pass crucial divine tests. To learn more on how we can gain access to the ultimate privilege, we explore the lives of a number of companions, ordinary people who became extraordinary. Looking for clues as to what turned them into the invincible forces of nature that shaped history despite being persecuted and in many cases murdered. Individuals who carved their names in the annals of history as giants of devotion, faith, and sacrifice. Many are obscure to the average viewer, but that will be no more. These are their stories. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأراضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة بن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته One of the greatest lessons we learn from the legend of Imam al Hussein, is that Hussein is the true spring of immortality. Hussein was the elixir of eternity. And that if one desires to be remembered, if we wish to be immortalized, then Hussein is the key to making that happen. You see, most people, their lives end when they surrender their soul. And that may happen as a result of a plethora of factors, whether it's sickness, whether it's an accident, whether it's the loss of a critical organ or whatever it may be. When that moment comes, that represents the end of their life. And depending on who you ask, <clears throat> what the definition of life actually is, you'll end up getting different answers. But for the most part, I think that the vast majority of people <coughs> will define life as the ability to affect change in this physical world of ours. Meaning that the sign of a living human being, a living creature, is that they can influence their environment. I can pick things up. I can speak and you'll hear my voice. I can move from one place to another. If I'm able to do those things, then most people would say that I'm alive. If I seize the ability to affect change within my environment, if I stop moving, if I stop breathing, if I stop making noises, if my bodily organs 
cease to function as they normally do, if everything comes to a grinding halt, then most people would say that that person is no longer alive. However, there is a way that individuals can continue to affect change in their environment even after they die. And that is the definition of martyrdom. You see, there's a reason why people visit the shrines of martyrs and they beseech God in the name and honor of those noble personalities. And somehow they're able to receive answers to their prayers. Their wishes are fulfilled. And what that proves is that those individuals are not dead in the traditional medical sense of the word. They are in fact alive, except we don't have the capacity to sense what that means. We lack the intellectual capability of understanding how a dead person can simultaneously be dead, but also very much alive. <clears throat> And this, of course, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in the Holy Quran. When he says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتِ بَلْ أَحْيَاءِ وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ Do not perceive those that have been slain in the way of Allah as being dead. Don't think that they're dead. You don't understand. You cannot perceive their life. You lack the ability to understand that they're very much alive. In fact, Allah then continues to say, they are alive and receiving sustenance from their Lord. Now, what that actually means, that they receive sustenance directly, obviously everybody receives sustenance, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here, Allah is trying to draw our attention to a reality that is beyond our comprehension. He says that they receive sustenance from their Lord, directly from God. What that sustenance is, how they are able to receive it, how they benefit from it, the fact that that sustenance allows them to affect physical change in the physical realm of ours in this dunya is just mind-boggling. But that is what immortality means. Now, one thing that uh, a lot of people might find interesting is that uh, immortality is in fact the most exclusive club. It's a club that everybody wants to be a member of. However, it is by invitation only. You can't buy your way into it. You can't use political influence. There is in fact nothing you can do to become a member of the club of immortality. As I said, everybody wants to join in. Presidents, kings, Every political leader puts their name <coughs> and creates effigies and builds skyscrapers and monuments. Dictators create a culture of idol worship around their personalities. This personality cult that, you've, that you hear about, for example, when talking about the North Korean leader or uh, the ruler of these fascist regimes, Children sing their praises every single day. All of this is an effort to be immortalized and be remembered. Muawiyah, in fact, left no stone unturned. He tried every trick in the book to ensure that he is immortalized, that people will continue to remember him even beyond the grave. And... In doing so, what happens is you find that these tyrants, they take the wrong route. You're trying to be remembered, but that's not how you're remembered. For example, one thing he did was that he paid these reporters and narrators 
to fabricate and concoct traditions and attribute those traditions falsely to the Prophet of Islam in praise and in the uh, alleged merits of the first three caliphs. Of course, any mention of Ali ibn Abi Talib was outrightly banned. It was a crime punishable by either imprisonment or even death. No one could speak of the merits of Ali. But the first three Khulafa, he established these hadith manufacturing assembly lines, so to speak. And he created hundreds and even thousands of them. Then historians say he got to a point where he said to all these scribes and narrators that look, we've, we've made enough traditions about the merits of the first three. Now I want you to make up traditions about me. I want you to speak of the grandeur of Muawiyah. And so he did all of these things. He paid handsome amounts of money to the scribes to concoct all of those fabricated and false traditions. But what did that get him? SubhanAllah. When you visit the capital city where Muawiyah was the king and undisputed ruler, where he attempted to do everything in order to immortalize himself, there is not a single sign that reminds you of Muawiyah. There is not a trace of Muawiyah or the household of Muawiyah. Instead, the most ancient site in that city of Damascus is the small shrine of the three-year-old orphan of Imam al Hussein, Lady Ruqayya alayha salam. Subhanallah. Wa makaru wa makara Allah, wallahu khayru al makareen. They can plot, they can scheme, they can come up with the most sophisticated means of hatching those plans of theirs, but God can also plot, and God is the best of plotters, He's the best of schemers. Muawiyah's name is erased from the annals of history and Ruqayyah is the undisputed queen of Damascus, even though she was only three years old. But it's not about your age. The infant of Imam al Hussein was only six months old. But it's not about age. It's not about whether you're perceived as small or weak or vulnerable or poor or any of those things. When you connect with Imam al Hussein, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, you receive the elixir of immortality. You become a giant in your own right. And as the poet says, Fisham fi mathwa umayyata marqadun yunbika kayfa damu shahadati yakhludu. When you visit Damascus, you will find a small shrine which reminds all of us once again that the blood of the martyr is immortalized. كذب الموت فالحسين مخلد كلما مر الزمان تجدد. Death is but a lie when it comes to the martyrs. When it comes to Hussein, he is in fact immortal. And in fact, this isn't just things we read about in poetry. This is in the very words of the infallible Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. When they taught us how to send our blessings and greetings upon Imam Al Hussein in his visitation, in his ziyara, we say, Ashhadu anna damaka sakan al khuld waqsha'arat lahu adhillatul arsh. I bear witness that your blood rested in immortality. Allahu Akbar. This is Imam al Hussein, and this is anyone who connects with Imam al Hussein, which is why they say that a man by the name of uh, Ibrahim ibn Talha came to Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam when he was in Sham. In other words, this is Imam Zain al Abidin, Imam al Sajjad, at his most vulnerable place. This is the individual that the enemy perceived as being crushed and defeated. He was 
in a state that they felt deserved nothing but empathy. And so he came to the Imam with a question that was designed to crush him even further. When he said to him, من الذي غلب في كربلاء Who won in كربلاء? Who is the one that conquered their enemy? Who's the one that defeated their enemy? So the Imam responded with a statement that continues to echo throughout the ages. What did he say? He said to him, إِذَا حَانَ وَقْتُ الصَّلَاةِ أَذْذِنْ ثُمَّ أَقِمْ when it's time for prayer, recite the adhan, the call to prayer, then the iqamah, لتعرف من الغالب, and you will know who is the winner. In other words, when you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Rasulullah, you will know that we are the one who defeated Yazid, not the other way around. Now, there is a story that I'd like to share with you, which encapsulates this message of immortality. Because as I said, people come into this world and they live their lives. Eventually, everybody dies and no one remembers them. It doesn't matter how many banners you've put up on skyscrapers. It doesn't matter how many monuments you've built for yourself. It doesn't matter how much money and wealth you accumulated. Everybody dies. Everybody is forgotten. But this story reminds us that if only we connected to Da'i Allah. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran. Ya ayyuhal ladheena aman. O you who believe. O people, human beings who are in search and constant pursuit of immortality. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Ajeebul Allah, istajeebu lillah wa lirrasool. Respond to God and to His Messenger. Ida da'akum lima yuhyikum. When He invites you to that which gives you what? Life. It gives you true life. It gives you the kind of life that encompasses this world. It doesn't end with your, the cessation of physical funct functions. It doesn't end with you being laid into your grave. The kind of life that goes above and beyond the limitations of this world. Istajibu lillah. There are those who connected to Imam al Hussein, to the Messenger of Allah, to those who call on to Allah, and in doing so, they were immortalized. One such example is an elderly man by the name of Abdullah ibn Afif al Azdi. He was an individual who led his life in pursuit of service to God and in complete loyalty to God's messenger and the successors of that messenger. He fought alongside Amir al muminin in all three of his battles while he was the Khalifa. He defended the essence of Islam with every modicum of his existence, with every iota of his being. He did all of that. And yet, there was this desire which was never fulfilled. There was one thing that was so elusive to him, and that was martyrdom. Listen to how history narrates the legendary story of this man. They say that when Imam al Hussein was killed, and I personally believe that this incident occurred immediately after the day of Ashura, 
perhaps a day or two after the tragic events of that day. In other words, when news reached Kufa, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad ascended the pulpit and he began saying the following words. And I ask Imam al-Zaman for forgiveness, for relaying the words of this wicked, wretched man. But the reason I am relaying them, the reason I am quoting him, is to show you the grandeur of Abdullah ibn Afif al-Azdi. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad called everyone to go to Masjid al-Kufa. Now, I want you to remember that Masjid al-Kufa is a very substantial uh, property. It's a massive building which accommodates up to 100,000 people, even back in those days. 100,000 immediately assembled in Masjid al-Kufa because they heard that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad wants to deliver uh, a very important uh, news and give the sermon which he was about to give. So everybody's assembled, everybody's now listening to this wretched man. What does he say? He says, and I quote once again with my deep apologies to the Imam of the time, Alhamdulillah alladhi azhar al haqqa wa ahlah. He said, Praise be to God who revealed the truth and the people of the truth. وَنَصَرَ أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَزِيدَ وَحِزْبَهِ And gave victory to the commander of the faithful, Yazid, and his partisans. نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ My apologies for saying what he said after this. وَقَتَلَ الْكَذَّابِ بْنَ الْكَذَّابِ وَشِيعَتَهِ And praise be to God for killing the liar, the son of the liar, and his Shia and his companions. In reference to who? In reference to Imam al Hussein. Now listen to this. Historians say, فَلَمْ يَفْرُغْ عَنْ مَقَالَتِهِ He wasn't done finishing his statement. حَتَّى وَثَبَ إِلَيْهِ Suddenly this man jumped from his seat and confronted Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. He said to him, يَا بْنَ مَرْجَانَهِ الكذاب ابن الكذاب أنت وأبوك O oh, son of that wicked filthy woman مرجانة The liar, the son of the liar is you and your father ومن استعملك وأبوه And whoever appointed you and his father Meaning Yazid يا عدو الله ورسوله O oh, enemy of God and his messenger أتقتلون أبناء النبيين وتتكلمون هذا الكلام على منابر المسلمين. He said, "You are an enemy of God. You've killed the son of the prophet of God, and you speak the language of those who are truthful on the pulpit. How dare you say these things?" Now imagine, at this point. This elderly man is speaking to who? To Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Not only was he old, but through his participation in the battles of Safin, uh, first of all, Jamal, then Safin, they say that in Jamal, he lost his right eye. He was blinded in the right eye because he was struck on it. And in Safin, he was struck on his forehead and his eyebrows, which ultimately led to the blinding of his left eye. He had been blind all his life, since the time of Amirul Mu'mineen, for all these years. And, which is, as a result of that, they say, All he could really do was spend his days and nights in prayer inside Masjid al-Kufa. And yet, despite being old, despite being wounded, despite being blind, look how his heart radiated with this shine of loyalty to God and his messenger. He stands up before this tyrant and he challenges him. Not only does he do that, he reciprocates the insults that he hurls against 
the son of the messenger of God, you call him a liar, you call Hussein a liar, you are the liar, Yazid is the liar. Now imagine Ibn Ziyad was a tyrant and tyrants and despots don't want to have anyone challenging them. And so immediately the first thing he did was Man al he said, who is the one speaking? Who is this challenging me like this and insulting me? Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, uh, Abdullah ibn Afif al-Azdi stood up and he said to him, I am the one saying this. You filthy monster, you liar. How dare you do this? He wasn't afraid of him. He wasn't uh, hesitating in any way, shape or form. Now, imagine the circumstances, how tense things are. You've got up to 100,000 people sitting down, everybody quiet, you've got scholars, you've got military leaders, you've got reciters of the Quran, you've got all manner of people. Not a single one spoke up except for Abdullah ibn Afif al-Azdi. They say that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad immediately out of rage said, Khudu, take him. What happened was Abdullah ibn Afif had a very big and powerful tribe. So he called for them to come and help him. 700 men stood up. All of them were members of the tribe of Azd. There were other people who didn't want to have Abdullah ibn Afif say these words because they were afraid for their own lives. They were afraid that something would happen to them. Some in fact told him, why would you say these things? You have now led to your own death as well as ours. But 700 men from the tribe of Azd got up and they took Abdullah ibn Afif outside of the masjid. However, just like those who abandoned Muslim ibn Aqil in Kufa, and Hani ibn Urwa, and those who abandoned Imam al Hussein, the tribe of Azd, could only muster taking this elderly, courageous star of a member of this tribe to his home and leaving him there. And of course, he couldn't care less. They took him to his house. Historians say, that the only member of his family that, that survived and that was there with him was his young daughter. So when he entered the home, he told his daughter that they're coming after me. However, I will grab my sword and I want you to keep a lookout. If they come to get me, help me be my eyes, help me see my surroundings, if they attack me from any angle, tell me so that I could defend myself. Imagine, put yourself in the shoes of that young girl, seeing that her father is being attacked and all she can do is to tell him which direction to face. Her father who is old and blind, SubhanAllah. They say that soon enough the troops of Ibn Ziyad came to the house of Abdullah ibn Afif. They broke down the door they entered the courtyard. His daughter kept telling him, Father, they've attacked you from the right side and he would defend himself. They've attacked you from the left side and he would fight ferociously in defense of himself and his family. Eventually, they got a hold of him and they took him, they arrested him and they took him back to Ibn Ziyad. Now listen to the conversation that takes place between this great man and Ibn Ziyad. They say that when they brought him there, the first thing uh, Ibn Ziyad told Abdullah ibn Afif was that Alhamdulillah alladhi akhzak, praise be to God for humiliating you. Abdullah said to him, Ya Aduwallah, O enemy of God, bimadha akhzani. How did God humiliate me? I was never humiliated. You are the one who's been humiliated. Ibn Ziyad then said to him, Ma taqulu fi Uthman? What's your view on Uthman? As though that's the litmus test. If you oppose Uthman, then you're a Alawi. If you praise Uthman, then you are against Imam al Hussein. So what do you think about Uthman? Abdullah ibn Afif said to him, Yabna Marjana, Yabna Sumayya. O son of Marjana, 
that wicked woman and everybody knew who Marjana was. O oh, son of Sumayya and everybody who knew, knows who that woman was. She has a reputation that everyone is aware of. Ya Abd Bani Alaj, ma anta wa Uthman. What have you got to do with Uthman? What do you care about Uthman? Whether he was good or bad. Walakin selni anka wa an abik. Ask me about you and about your father. Wa an Yazid wa an abih. Ask me about Yazid and about his father, and I'll tell you exactly what I think about them. Ubaidullah knew not to rock this boat. He didn't want more scandals and more stories about his ancestry and about his forefathers. He said, I won't ask you anything. Instead, I will make you die a slow and agonizing death. Faqala ibn Afif. Now listen to what uh, Abdullah ibn Afif al Azdi said to him. He said, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah. My gratitude to Allah. Ama inni kuntu as'alullah rabbi an yarzuqan shahada I've been asking God for martyrdom qabla an talidaka ummuk before your mother gave birth to you. This has always been my lifelong wish. You threaten me with martyrdom? I want nothing more than martyrdom. وَسَأَلْتُهُ سُبْحَانَهُ أَنْ يَجْعَلَ الشَّهَادَةَ عَلَى يَدَيْ أَلْعَنِ خَلْقِهِ And I've always prayed to God to make my death at the hand of the most accursed of his creatures, the worst of the worst. وَأَبْغَضَهُمْ إِلَيْهِ وَلَمَّا ذَهَبَ بَصَرِي آيَسْتُ مِنَ الشَّهَادَةِ But when my eyes were blinded, I lost hope. I didn't think I would have the chance to be martyred. In fact, had Abdullah ibn Afif al-Azdi had his eyesight, he would have rushed to Karbala. He would have gone to defend Imam al Hussein there, but because he was blind, he thought I could never fight and therefore I will never receive martyrdom. However, now I know that Allah has answered my prayer. Praise be to Allah for having granted me this honor, this station of martyrdom and shown to me that prayers do indeed get answered. He was killed. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad ordered him to be beheaded and then his body was crucified in the garbage yard of Kufa. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad is trying to humiliate him. He's trying to destroy his remembrance. And yet look at us today. We're speaking of this great individual, his heroic martyrdom, his stance in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as the Holy Prophet says famously in that hadith of his, Afdalu al-jihad kalimatu haqqin anda sultan jair The greatest struggle in the way of Allah is to speak a word of truth in the presence of a tyrannical ruler, which is exactly what Abdullah ibn Afif al-Azdi did, which is why scholars believe that he is considered amongst the martyrs of Karbala. When we send our blessings upon the martyrs of Karbala, Abdullah is among them. Now, when I Remember the story. One thing that hurts me deeply is the incident that deals with the daughter of Abdullah ibn Afif. Can you imagine being in the shoes of this young girl, seeing her father fighting off these wretched men and then being wounded, subdued, tied up, and carried toward a certain death. Historians, in fact, say that she began to cry when they captured her father. When they finally apprehended this hero, she started to cry. She said, Ya Abati, Laytani kuntu rajulan, fa'uqatila ha'ula'il lu'ana'a. 
I wish I were a man so that I could fight alongside you. These enemies of God, the killers of the family of the Prophet, the children of the Messenger of God, I wish I could fight alongside you. I wish I were a man. Now, I say to the daughter of Abdullah ibn Hafif al it must have been very difficult, very painful for you to see your father being tied up and carried away to never return again. But where were you when they brought the severed head of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam to his three-year-old orphan in the ruins of Shah. <laughs> Allah, man, I have a Hussein.